we have an hour and 45 minute session, so we have lots of time for Q&A in here. So um, Lynn's passed around some cards for you to put some questions down on. Uh, and if, if you didn't get one, let her know. She'll be walking around collecting those. Uh, if you uh, stump the panel, You'll win a free trip next, no, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so we put this together a long time ago, back in January, February, um, and we're, I'll let Lynn announce what this session is, but I think you're in for a treat here because we got some great people on the panel who've been doing cool things in their research and hopefully you can learn from everyone. So Lynn, you wanna take over? Well, he's already done my job. <laughs> but, uh, my most important job actually is uh, to make sure no one speaks more than what they should, especially Dr. Kurt Bunk. <laughs> so um, as Dr. Bunk mentioned, um, each panel will speak about 15 minutes and then they will ask each other questions and then we'll open the um, questions to the floor and I will be the timer. Um, so, okay, so who is going to be the first? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Oh, actually, my job was to read the title <laughs> to systematic reviews of the research on emerging online technologies, what's been done and what's to come. Thank you. Okay, welcome and thank you for coming this afternoon. I'm going to be talking about social media research um, with a focus on learning and education and specifically about where that research happens to be. My name is Vanessa Denon. I'm at Florida State University and I some of this work that I'm doing, I'm also doing with two of my doctoral students, Hajin Chue and Carrie Nisley. Um, from my own research, some of the things that I, hmm, closer? Okay, um, from my own research, some of the things that became immediately apparent when I started thinking about the larger body of research that's being done in this area is that students are concerned with a lot of things that, when it comes to the topic of social media. They're concerned about privacy issues, context collapse, when their different worlds collide on social media. Um, not just how they use it in the classroom, but how they use it out of the classroom to support learning that occurs in the classroom and to support learning and personal needs in their everyday lives. Um, a lot of them don't really have a good grasp of how we might use it in the classroom unless they've had a direct experience with it. And they've also indicated that they would benefit a lot from guidance at bridging points. So like when they move from high school into college and when they move from college out into the workforce because it's a, those are points where the use of social media can become different and they don't fully understand how to do it. They also want access to a lot of free materials online, um, particularly multimedia things, and they want to access them through their different social media sources. If you start to take all of this together and think about it, you get this big picture of a user who is operating within this larger system, and that's what social media does for us. So you have a lot of education researchers who think about pedagogical uses of social media, how we can embed this into our classroom lessons, but if you switch to the learner perspective, they're thinking about how social media affects them, not just at school, but at home and at work and with their friends and their various activities and within their faith groups. And their phone, when we've all got one, we're carrying it around with us, and it's the device that brings all of those spaces and places and people together for us at once. We cannot easily separate them and this becomes a concern in the research. So setting forth to look at where the research is overall, and I'm currently working with um, my two doctoral students on um, a, a systematic scoping review of the research. and. So we search for Web of Science, What's, what do you find when you look for social media and education or learning? What comes up? And I just want to highlight for you how that research is classified. So of 2,100 more or less articles, 412 have the primary classification of being ed and ed research articles. Think about that for a minute. We do not own the market on social media and education or learning. We may have the largest market share, but there are other fields that are doing research in this area. Are we paying attention to them? 
When we look within those 412 ed and ed research articles, what we start to see is the areas where there is some overlap. So you get computer science, um, public environmental, occupational health. There's a lot of public health interest in this area. Communication, linguistics. If you think about it, these are some very natural places for there to be overlap with our own research on social media. Once you exclude them, so these are articles that are not tagged as being related to ed and ed research in any way. You start to find a lot that's been published in information science and library science. Again, the whole public health realm and computer science and communication and healthcare science and nursing. There's a lot of work that's being done in different disciplines um, that's targeted in different areas. So we are not necessarily the leaders in all of this. The publication trends have been steadily going upward year after year, and the final year that you'll see on there is 2018, and you'll see that it's almost up to 2017 levels, and we still have ourselves two and a half months to go, so I think we can get there and beat last year. I think it's probably going to happen. Now let's take a look at the most cited articles. One of the things I want to point out to you, the numbers that I have in there on red, are the number of times these articles have been cited. So this is the 300 plus club. There are seven articles that have been um, cited more than 300 times in this search. And three of them do come from the edited research category, uh, but you look at the overall ones, 906 times this article that was in Business Horizons has been cited. 761 times for another one in Business Horizons. There's a lot of work that we are not necessarily paying attention to. Um, what we've been finding in our scoping review is that a lot of the work is being done with a North American focus, followed by Europe. Um, this makes sense if you think about the search being done through Web of Science and who's publishing in all of these predominantly English language journals that are, are um, in there. Um, approximately 80% of them have been empirical articles with a balance more or less of qualitative and quantitative research and a bit of mixed in there as well. Surveys and interviews have been the most common approach for data collection. Um, about 45% of them are explicitly educational, whether they are classified as ed and ed research officially or not. And the other topics that we're finding a lot on are like negative and risky behaviors, psychological issues, and health-related issues. And there certainly is a lot of concern about how we can use social media to help people who are having difficulties in this area, and as well as difficulties that are caused by social media in these areas, and how we can use learning approaches to help mitigate some of that. So what do I feel we need to know and do at this point? I want to give you, um, not just from the scoping review, but also my perspective as an editor. I happen to be one of the two editors of the Internet and Higher Education. And a lot of the stuff that none of you ever see, because it, it doesn't even make it out to reviewers a lot of the time. A lot of unfocused case studies, endless um, adoption surveys. You know, do, does, will this group adopt the technology? Will that group adopt the technology? We need a lot less of that at this point in time. We need some more more examples of pedagogical innovation, the ability to replicate things, clear measures of learning, uh, meaningful inter measures of interaction, thinking about some of this longitudinally, which really hasn't happened very much yet, thinking about the skills that people are getting through social media as well as the skills that they need to develop in order to be lifelong learners and good digital citizens in the future. And these are things that would all um, fit into my own journal very nicely, but beyond that, I see a need for more interdisciplinary work and consideration of holistic and cross-context use purposes because we have all of these other people who are doing research in this area. And um, my little research team is starting to do bibliometric analysis of this. And one of the things we're finding, not surprisingly, is that people in different fields are not talking to each other. We need to do a better job of talking to each other. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, for providing a broad view of uh, the research conducted in social media, education, and learning. And my focus uh, is, a, an, is on a particular line of research, which is related to educators. Uh, social media use, particularly Twitter use, for professional learning and development. 
So I'm going to briefly summarize the research questions that have been asked, the research findings, the research methods that are commonly adopted, and the future research trends. And a variety of research questions have been asked, um, but most of them can be categorized into three of the following major questions. The first one is, what do educators do with Twitter? And the second, why do educators use Twitter? And the third one is, how do educators interact with each other using Twitter? And the methods used are mainly survey, content analysis, and automated data processing as a part of content analysis, social networking analysis, and more recently, researchers start to use multiple research methods to provide a more comprehensive understanding of a few research questions related to um, Twitter use in professional learning and development. What do educators do with Twitter? Educators mainly use Twitter for uh, one or more of the three following major things. Communication, get connected, maintain relationship, improve communication with others, resource sharing, share professional resources and useful resources for work, and uh, the news in the field, and collaboration. Why do educators use Twitter? A group of researchers have conducted, um, uh, investigated that and found uh, many educators use Twitter to relieve a sense of isolation, establish social network, inform their thinking, or shape practice, develop digital writing skills, generate, uh, generate professional opportunities, and enhance the capacity to support students. Here is a quote that I received from one educator who really enjoyed using Twitter as a professional development tool. What is interesting in this quote is that he not on, uh, she not only talked about Twitter, but also talked about blogs and meeting in a conference with other Twitter users. It seems like Twitter opened up a lot of more opportunities for those educators to get other professional development opportunities. So peering, analyzing the, their activities on Twitter may not be enough for us to understand what is really going on and the profound impact of Twitter on their professional learning and development. How do educators interact using Twitter? There are always, a, in any Twitter community, there are always a group of small group of people who are closely connected with each other, but the majority of uh, the Twitter users are loosely connected. And the levels of participation are always uneven. Uh, what is interesting is people always come and go. For example, for the ad chat community, um, when people, where people participate in synchronous chat, you can see every year there are a large number of people leaving that um, ad chat community, but at the same time, they are replaced by an even larger number of people who just come in as newcomers. That really poses a question of, uh, whether they leave because they have obtained what they really want and they think this is sufficient, or they leave because they try to Twitter and feel like this is not a right platform for them to continue their professional development learning experience. Um, here are some possible future research directions, such as how to automate the analysis of tweet, uh, tweets or uh, other online discourse, how to provide guidance or structures in such learning environment, how to encourage participants to use social media for sustained engagement, and how to develop grouping mechanism to help participants to form groups so that they can um, be better connected with each other. And finally, how to effectively combine learning with social media with other forms of informal and formal learning. Thank you. I leave it.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ke Zhang from Wayne State University. I figured there's no way I can top either of those presentations. So let's quickly switch gears. OK, let's look at something completely different, public health education on social media in China. So when you think about social media, most of us are probably thinking about Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, right? But for my Chinese friends, when we think about social media, you're probably thinking about WeChat, Weibo, QQ, right? So um, um, I hope you can see this clearly enough. What this does is it shows you the uh, number of users of some of the most popular social media in China and then compares those numbers to the population of some countries in the world. So for example, that cute little penguin on the top of the center, that's QQ. Okay, a few years ago, the number of QQ users were already more than 500 million. So that's more than the entire population in Europe. So that gives you an idea of how popular social media really is in China. And then naturally, you're going to be wondering what kind of power that really is if we could utilize it to full for education. And I was particularly interested in using social media to promote public health education. Um, so I started with a simple question. I wanted to look at what different types of social media use in China might have been able to attract the general public into public health related learning activities and furthermore if they were able to actually um, create or sustain some informal learning communities on social media. All right, so I started with some crazy, literally crazy searches on some of the most popular social media in China. Um, and I had a long list of selection criteria. One of them, as you might have noticed, that's highlighted on the slide, is that you know, those social media users must have more than 10,000 followers, um, one social media at least. Okay. Um, so these are the social media that I went through for initial searches. And I was able to find 28 public health focused users on Sina Weibo alone, okay, meeting all of my um, criteria. So I then had to do another round of screening. Um, I looked at their social media activities and trying to identify if there's any evidence for an active informal learning community or if there's any efforts trying to engage students, or not students, the general public into public health related learning activities there. So um, what you see here is an example of some of the top users that I eventually selected to do further analysis in the study. Um, I had a highly regarded cardiologist, and I have the Minister of Health, of course, and some other different types of users there. So this shows you some different types of data that I was able to gather from one of the social media. And then in terms of data analysis, I definitely need, need more than five minutes to talk about it. So simply put, um, I mined social me um, the data on social media, and uh, there's a snapshot looking at just you know, within seven days of activities on one particular social media from one user. That shows you how active they are. Um, I was able to you know, figure out some shared characteristics of those most successful, most engaging learning communities that have emerged and sustained on social media in China, focusing on public health education. And one of them is like, you know, they all used more than one social media. They were very smart integrating different social media for different purposes. And they were able to provide not just expert provided content, but also engage the general public you know, to invite um, more user generated knowledge and information sharing. And they were very active and they were very smart in terms of choosing the topics and the timing of their different activities. Some of the highlighted most engaging learning moments were actually those live mini sessions. They could be mini interviews or debates or sometimes discussions. And they were typically, you know, very much related to what's going on, a controversial or a hot social topic or event. So a few strategies that I was able to identify that have made them very successful in engaging and um, sustaining some informal learning communities on social media, focusing on public health education. Um, next steps, uh, a lot more research, obviously. and. Um, and really, you know, it, what's most important, I think, is that we take it from here and then work more closely with who are actually actively on social media and try to bridge the gap between practice and, and research. And let's do it more and do it better together. Thank you.
Thank you. I want to acknowledge my colleague John Hilton, who had some uh, travel slip-ups and is unable to be here today. We wish he was here with us, but uh, I think he's getting home just about now from the trip he had been on previously. So uh, we were uh, today to talk about the research on open educational resources, and uh, that's what I'll proceed to do here for a few minutes. Uh, before we can do research on open educational resources, it would be important to understand uh, what open educational resources are. So let me share with you the uh, official definition of the term. The term open educational resources was coined in 2002 at a UNESCO meeting, and this is the definition that UNESCO provided uh, at the time that they put these words together and said, let's call this thing open educational resources. Those are any type of educational materials that are in the public domain or are introduced with an open license. So OER is defined in terms of copyright status. Uh, if you have an education resource which you are free to make copies of, you are free to make changes to, and you are free to share with others, then you have an open educational resource. Everyone is freely permitted to copy, edit, and share OER. However, any Grumpy Cat fans? Anybody? Okay, thank you. Um, you know, as OER started, uh, became a thing and started circulating, people started to kind of have this attitude about, well, if OER are free for me to make copies of and, you in my and use in my classroom, they probably won't very effectively support student learning because you get what you pay for, like a more expensive car is better than a cheaper car, a more expensive stereo is better than a cheaper stereo. That uh, $280 textbook that I use in my class must be a lot better than this free stuff that's available on the internet. And this uh, kind of conversation was enabled by, over the first uh, decade of OER, we can trace open content movement really back to 1998, so it's about 20 years old right now, uh, to just a complete lack of empirical research on the impact on student learning of OER adoption in the classroom. In fact, there's a single empirical article looking at this question between 2000 and 2010 although there are several hype pieces and uh, opinion pieces about open educational resources. Um, so around 2008, uh, some grad students and other faculty and I got together and said, but let's, let's try to actually create some research in this space and see if we can't get something going here. So the Open Education Group is the research umbrella under which John and I and Lane Fisher, our colleague at BYU, uh, together with graduate students who kind of come and go, do that work. So we created this group and we created a research framework that we call the COOP framework, COOP standing for cost, outcomes, usage, and perception, and uh, started doing some research here and trying to get other people interested in doing empirical work on the impact of OER adoption on student learning. Um, a couple of years later, we created the OER Research Fellows Program. This is a program that is funded by the William and Flory Hewlett Foundation. Uh, where each year we take in about 25 uh, either senior graduate student or early career faculty and uh, provide them with mentorship, with ideas, with access to data and to partners so that they can conduct uh, research on OER. And then also we've been experimenting with some uh, novel kind of research synthesis and dissemination strategies, which I'll talk about in a moment. So just let me give you an example of one of the kinds of research uh, that's been done. This was published uh, two years ago in Erodal. Uh, study including about 35,000 students looking at a measure that we call the course throughput rate. And the course throughput rate, imagine kind of either a medieval gauntlet, if you like that metaphor, or a marketing funnel, if that metaphor speaks to you more directly. But you have students at the beginning of term who come into a course, and for a student to be able to come out the other side of that course making satisfactory progress toward graduation, they have to not drop the course, they have to not withdraw from the course, and they have to receive a see or better final grade in the course, and we lose people at every step along that pipeline. And so we wanted to look at the impact of OER adoption on uh, this throughput rate. And so you know, we have tr traditionally copyrighted materials on the left-hand side, OER on the right-hand side of the funnel here. This for face-to-face -face sections. Uh, you can see that there's about a six-point advantage in the CTR rate for students who are using OER. And although the details are a little different in terms of the advantage, you can see here in online courses, the advantage is primarily in the drop rate, whereas in face-to-face -face courses, there was more advantage in the withdrawal rate. Uh, but as you see those things come together again for online classes as well, there's about a six-point uh, difference in favor 
of students whose faculty used OER. So where are we today in terms of kind of overall the research on taking an empirical look at the impacts of OER adoption on student outcomes? Today there are 22 peer-reviewed studies uh, that cover about 184,000 students across all those studies. 95% of those showing that students whose faculty choose OER over traditionally copyrighted materials have either the same outcomes or better outcomes. And that's looking at, uh, in the DV column here, things like completion rate, credits taken, quiz score, exam score, overall GPA, drop rate, pass rate, uh, things like that. Uh, unfortunately, as you look in the left-hand column here, you can see that the majority of these studies do not control for teacher variables. The majority of them do not control for student variables. The majority of them don't do any randomization in terms of who is getting OER and who's getting traditionally copyrighted resources. So there's a lot of work to be done yet on tightening up the research designs for these studies. And on the right-hand side here, you can see uh, three studies not providing uh, any difference at all, or not providing any information about statistical significance, eight reporting no statistical significant, dif no significant difference, 10% with, or 10 studies with results that favored OER and one with results that favored traditionally copyrighted textbooks. Um, there has been some survey work and some interview work done as well. This is the perceptions uh, thread of the KU framework, asking faculty, asking students, what do you think about the OER that you used in this class? How does it stack up uh, to traditionally copyrighted resources that you've used in the past? Uh, about 13,000 students and professors across these studies have re responded to primarily three surveys. The surveys that are used are also open sourced, and so people tend to use and reuse the same surveys or slightly different versions of the surveys with different populations. And the finding here is that about 90% of professors and students say that OER are as good or better than in terms of their perception of the materials and their perception of the degree to which students are prepared when they come to class and, and things like that. So uh, let me talk about uh, these two kind of synthesis and dissemination techniques. The first is the review project and the second is the OER adoption impact calculator. The review project is uh, an initiative that John primarily runs. Uh, it's on our website. I'll share the URL in just a moment. Actually, I'll just share it now. Uh, OpenEdGroup.org slash review. This started out as a comprehensive, I put it in air quotes because there are so few studies at the time, uh, several years ago, a comprehensive uh, analysis of all of the research looking empirically uh, at the impact on student outcomes when faculty adopt OER instead of traditionally copyrighted materials. And what John has done is since publishing that work on the website now, uh, two or three times a year, he updates this review. So it's essentially a live literature review of every published article looking at um, anything inside this coup framework of cost, outcomes, usage, uh, and perceptions. So I'd encourage you to check that out. And this kind of notion of doing a live literature review, I'm not sure how much longer he'll be able to maintain it. Every year there's more and more work that gets done, and hopefully at some point there's so much research being done that one person can't read and maintain and, and write summaries of all of it. But for now, uh, you can find summaries and links to uh, literally every article in this area that's been published. The OER adoption impact calculator is kind of a different way of synthesizing and disseminating research. This is essentially a, uh, an interactive tool. You can see on the left-hand side here, there's some settings. Um, and those settings you can use to make uh, the tool reflect the context at your specific institution uh, or the specific OER adoption project that you're thinking about running. So it will ask things like, what's the average cost of the textbook you're replacing? How many students will it impact? Uh, you know, percentage of students paying in-state tuition versus out-of-state, et cetera. So you can configure these things on the left-hand side. And then each of these boxes presents, based on your local context, what the estimated impact of adopting OER in your context would be based on published research. And in each box, you can see there's a link to the article, a short description of the findings from the article that are used in making the calculations. And so this is kind of a, a, another way not quite drag and drop, but maybe select and slide, of getting a feel for how the research comes together uh, in a way that would impact you and yours uh, at your institution. And the URL for that is uh, impact.lumenlearning.com. So in terms of takeaways, uh, I want to just mention five kind of quick takeaways about this research. First, um, 
There's a growing body of studies that show that students who use OER perform as well or better than their peers use traditionally copyrighted materials. But going forward, we need much more rigorous research uh, that better accounts for what we would think are the primary confounding variables here, like the effect of the teacher, uh, the effect of students' academic history, and things like that. We need more studies that disaggregate data and allow us to look at the impact of OER adoption on specific populations, for example, Pell-eligible populations. Uh, and we also need studies that look at the interaction between the novel pedagogies that are enabled by OER and the impact on students whose faculty employ those novel pedagogies. Um, you might ask, if OER are defined in terms of copyright, how can there be novel pedagogies enabled by different copyright licenses? And the answer to that is kind of in, in five parts. First, I think we all broadly agree that we have to do in order to learn. We learn by doing. We learn by the things we do. I think there's no disagreement that the function of copyright is to restrict and limit the kinds of things that we're permitted to do uh, without some additional permissions. And if we learn by doing and copyright restricts the window of things we're able to do, then it might be true that copyright narrows the, the windows of ways in which we can learn. So if OER broadens those permissions, gives us permission to engage in activities and to do things that we couldn't do in the context of traditionally copyrighted materials, then it might follow that by being able to do new and different things, we might be able to learn in new and different ways. Um, so there's some very early work happening right now, nothing published yet in this area, but I think this is probably the most fruitful area for OER research uh, in the next three to five years. And finally, as you kind of step back from these questions about what is the impact of adopting this set of learning materials as opposed to that set of learning materials, you arrive very quickly at a really fundamental question, which is when you look at all the variance in student learning, some of that variance is attributable to the teacher, some of that variance is attributable to the student, some of that variance is attributable to things going on in the environment. What amount of that variance is actually attributable to learning materials, to materials created by instructional designers or others? Uh, is it 10% of that variance? Is it 30% of that variance? Is it 50% of that variance? How much of a difference is it even possible to make on student learning with learning materials? We don't know the answer to that question. And so when you look at research results that say, well, student learning moved by 0.2 standard deviations or by 1.1 standard deviations, you, do, it's, you don't have any sense of, is that a big move? Is that a small move? Are we there? Are we done? Do we have tons of headroom left in terms of improvement we could make? We, we don't even know what the theoretical upper limit is on the contribution to learning that can be made by learning materials in the context of all the other things that cause student learning to vary. So I think understanding the answer to this question, or at least finding ways to ask this question, uh, will be very key to our understanding and doing OER research as we go forward, and for us uh, as a field. Thank you. Test, test, test. Oh, it's working. Great. Cool. Rock and roll. So we've heard from a couple of the team members here. We're moving into the wonderful world of MOOCs. And uh, this is the title of the whole session, if you didn't see it in your program. I have my assistants, uh, my doc students, Mena Ju and uh, Anissa Sari, Mena from China and Anissa from Indonesia with me here to join me up in a little bit. Um, I have my minions with us. Um, my minions are very happy because uh, Mr. Trey Martindale is over here in the audience. Is that you, Trey, if I see right? Um, everyone give a round of applause to Trey Martindale, who approved this session. He made it a presidential session, so thank you very much, Trey. He's our incoming president, I believe, so um, good to know him. So we're all happy hearing about wonderful world of MOOCs, but there's a lot of weird stuff going on out there, you know? This is a weird field of MOOCs. When I go off to, to Japan, I got J MOOCs. I go to Korea in May, it was K MOOCs. I went to Thailand a year and a half ago, it was Thai MOOCs, not T MOOCs. My friend Michael's teaching one of those Thai MOOCs. There is when you have friends who are doing MOOCs and they're talking to you about the next MOOC they're going to do. This is weird. I'm going to teach 4,000 students. I'm going to teach 10,000. This is just a weird uh, situation we're in. We've collected 2,500 
instructor names who are doing MOOCs, and we're doing research with these 2,500 instructors, a whole series of things on self-directed learning and career development and stuff. It's weird when you get emails in the summer and saying, hey, you can sign up for a MOOC, and you can get a 10% discount if you sign up by tomorrow from EDX. Not to be outdone, Coursera sends you a note the next day. They don't want uh, you to go to EDX. You can be unstoppable if you go with Coursera MOOCs, right? This is weird. It's just weird. It's weird when you get a, a, a wedding announcement, and in the wedding announcement, they're talking about a, you know, potentially a husband who's going to get a degree from Harvard, a, a MOOC. In, in the list of what he's accomplished or going to accomplish, they list MOOCs. It's kind of weird. This is uh, last month in September in Inside Higher Ed. It's kind of weird when you hear about the death of MOOCs. There's a death of MOOCs. There's, a, there's a, oh, hype. There's nothing going on. But yet we've got 23 million new people, unique people, taking MOOCs that weren't taking them the previous year, up to 78 million, actually up to 90, over 800 institutions, and over 10,000 MOOCs out there now. There's no death of MOOCs. We just have to understand what's going on and what's making them effective. So we're going to talk about the research and the, and the research gaps and give a little summaries. We've done three parts. I'm going to talk about the first and second. They're going to join me here a little bit on the first part, and then they're going to talk about the third one that's going to be a sneak peek to what we're going to talk about at AERA. You're the first ones to see that piece of the data. But there's other people who have been in this wonderful world of MOOCs as well. You know, George Siemens had the Gates Foundation grant, and he was looking at the types of studies that were being done on MOOCs that were proposed. These were proposed studies. People didn't really do that. You look, it's pretty balanced there. But in actuality, when George Valetzianos, where's George? He's here somewhere. Crazy man, George, where'd you go? Um, there he is. You know, he found that really it's much more quantitative in nature, descriptive statistics, very student-focused, content-focused, design-focused, not much instructor-focused. Our team has been looking at the instructor side, but it's really heavily uh, weighted towards quantitative or mixed methods kinds of studies. More recent studies, so we got George and George, so we're going to have to have Paul and Ringo, or I got a P and a Q anyhow. Um, so they've, they've, they're looking at the same updated research, a systemic review of the research on MOOCs, and they find the same thing, more instructor-focused and student-focused, more survey-based, one method, not two or three methods typically. And George says we need to ver uh, diversify our methods more. We need to triangulate our methods. We need to step out of that just looking at computer log data and start looking through the quantitative, uh, qualitative field a bit more with ethnographic studies. So that's what we kind of found, too. So my team worked with Dr. Mimi Lee at the University of Houston two years ago, and they collected a whole set of studies, more than 100, and they analyzed them and published them in Vanessa's journal, Internet and Higher Education. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I'm sure my, my doc students are very appreciative of well, as well. And so they were asking questions in this study uh, about, you know, what kind of methods are being conducted, what topics are being looked at, where are the researchers coming from geographically, and where are they deliver? Where are these MOOCs being delivered from? And so they'll talk here a bit about the phases of the study. Come on up and talk about the phases, Mena. And then so you got that microphone. So uh, in order to search for the article, so we specifically uh, located for the Scopus Journal, but also search for other uh, journal article from other peer-reviewed journal, and then we also. Uh, use some criteria. For example, we only use uh, an article that is written in English, and then we we exclude. So we only focus on journal article. So we exclude books, and then newspaper, and then also uh, magazine, and also we focus on the article that is focused on the educational aspect. So, for example, if there is an article that is more uh, related with technical, for example, like uh, how to develop platform at, or how to develop a MOOCs. So uh, we exclude that. So and then uh, for the first phase, uh, which we uh, only review article from uh, October 2014 until to, uh, 2016 in November. And based on that, uh, for the research uh, question uh, number one about the research method, so mostly, uh, or quantitative is still dominating all the other research method, and then the second one is mixed method, and then the last one, qualitative. And then um, we further uh, ask or get the data about the number of data sources. For example, if there is uh, only use, they only use interview, so we count as one. 
and then if there are other uh, data sources, we count as two. So this is our finding. Most of them use uh, only one data sources. Thank you. So Mayna will be joining me here in a second. As you can see, these studies really were more student-focused and design-focused, just like George found, not as much instructor-focused, a little bit content-focused. If you divide them up by the research methods undertaken, you can see, again, the heavy emphasis over there on the quantitative side of the fence and mixed methods. Journals, IRODL is the big journal for MOOC research. 31 of these articles were there. Computers and Ed, British Journal, Online Learning, Distance Ed. Um, Internet Higher Ed only had five such studies. It's a more balanced journal, I guess, but you see a, every issue of IRODL seems to have a heavy influence on, on the MOOC, in the MOOC camp and OER camps. People are coming from US, UK, Australia, China, Spain. Those are the big countries where the researchers are coming from, question three. You can look at it in this display. You can see some other countries are doing one or two of these studies, Korea, Finland, Greece, Ecuador, Saudi Arabia, Sweden, and so forth. It's in terms of where the MOOC was delivered from, you see the same kinds of things. These researchers are from the US and UK, Australia. They're also delivering the MOOCs from those countries. Again, we're finding like George did, survey data, computer log data, database, platform data, interview, discussion forms. Uh, you can look at other data pieces. I think Faye would be glad to see Twitter-based network interaction analyses and, um, and content analyses and so forth. Um, there's also um, uh, Facebook group, Twitter feeds, uh, as you can see, other kinds of data, clickstream data, of course. Uh, in terms of data analysis methods, more specifically, there are some case studies and, and so forth, but per particularly you see descriptive and inferential statistics, content analysis, social network analysis thematic analysis, SWOT, a one. In terms of what are people looking at, motivation, retention, dropout, those are the big areas. Some bit uh, looking at uh, the learner experience, some people looking at instructional design, of course. Uh, cheating, plagiarism are among the studies that are out there. Quality, Alison Littlejohn and others in the UK are looking at quality. Uh, and study two, which I had a chance to present in uh, Amsterdam in June, we did a little comparison or update. We added 51 more studies from 2016-17, and uh, it's in the proceedings. I'm happy to send this to you. All these slides are at trainingshare.com. I'll come back to that later and mention that. So research methods, uh, again, if these 51 studies heavily emphasis quantitative, but you see now qualitative is picking up in the last year or so. More qualitative studies are being done, and if we compare phase one in blue and phase two in red, you can see in, in red, qualitative methods are much more alive and well in phase two compared to phase one. So people are listening to the message and so forth, but we still see the survey database interview data, same as before. And now in phase one is in red, phase two is in blue. We got the opposite colors. As you can see in, in phase two in blue, less survey-based research, more database, more observation, more focus group, uh, more interviews than in phase one. Uh, still a heavy emphasis on descriptive methods, inferential statistics, and so forth, but um, as you look at the comparisons here between phase one in blue and phase two in red, less descriptive, more of the studies in phase two are using learning analytics, not too surprising, more discourse analysis kinds of things going on, um, grounded approaches, one. Uh, again, retention and motivation kinds of things are pr predominant here in terms of num all across all these studies that they've looked at. 17 were retention, 15 motivation. You can see some other things being looked at in terms of learner attitudes and experiences, performance, and so forth and so on. Still across all these studies, over 190 some studies, we see that um, student focused, but instructor moved up a bit. Instructor focus moved up a bit. If we do a comparison between phase one and phase two, phase two in red, we see more of a focus uh, in phase two on the instructor than we had in phase one, but also more on student, less on design. There's less instructional design research in phase two, and here's just a split out of the methods that were undertaken uh, between the two phases. The, the authors, again, in phase two are, are, and phase one, this is across phase one and two, are mostly US, Spain, UK, just like before. Uh, but what's interesting here is people are collaborating within country. They have two or more people from within the same country, and much of the research, 19 of the new studies have that, so there's collaboration happening, um, which we didn't see in the first part. Uh, and again, in terms of where the MOOC was delivered from, the same kind of data coming out there. So Maine is going to walk us through, we've got a couple minutes left, I think, walking us through phase three a bit, and I'll add a final comment at the end of all that. 
Okay, so as Dr. Bank mentioned, so this study we only present the prelim uh, preliminary data uh, because we submit to another conference. So um, we collect data from 2013, 2018 uh, until the June. Um, we also search articles from 2011, 2012, but there are no many, uh, no study related to the empirical MOOC studies. Based on this uh, figure, you can see that the green line, the it's IRODL, it's the most uh, published journals in MOOC field, and then there are these are the trends for each journal uh, in, in MOOC empirical studies. And then this table shows that um, uh, in total during the last five years, so the journals published uh, most in MOOC, as Dr. Bank mentioned, it's ARODL and also computer uh, and education and British BGET journals. And in terms of the research method, it's uh, similar with our previous uh, MOOC uh, review data. So the quantitative uh, method is the used, uh, was the most used uh, method and are followed by the mixed methods. Um, in terms of the MOOC research methods used in different countries, as you can see, the China, uh, the scholars in China use the most uh, of the quantitative method for uh, MOOC research. However, in uh, researchers from UK used a more balanced research measure uh, among these three quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods. I'm not sure if there's many audience from China, maybe you agree with this or not. And then this is the change of the types, uh, types of MOOC research method used by the year. As you can see that quantitative is the most. Uh, if you see in 2018 it's lower, it's because it's only half uh, a year's research data. And then uh, corresponding with previous study survey is the most uh, used data collection method. Followed by that is the platform data and interview. So I, I, I know you're seeing some of the same things over and over again. You're probably wondering why we have, you know, presented some of the same sl similar slides. They aren't the same. Because we keep building, we keep adding. They basically got all the research from 2012 to today. And this, this is the only data set I think, George might be, correct me if I'm wrong, um, and we are, we're going to keep working on this till AERA and present some of this. So this is a sneak peek of our AERA data. Uh, and if you're not tired of MOOCs, download our new study. It just come out in IRODL on personalizing MOOCs. It just uh, came out two weeks ago, and that's my team. Uh, Mink Young Kim and Anissa Sari is in there, Mena and um, Najia Sabar and, and, um, and Shuya Zhu. So um, that's our session, our, our part of our session, the third part in here. I want to thank Mena and, and Anissa for joining me. I want to thank Dr. Mimi Lee, who led to all this work. Uh, she couldn't make it here, but uh, let's give a round of applause for my team. Thank you. Uh, my name is Florence Martin. I'm a professor in Instructional Systems Technology at uh, UNC Charlotte. And along with me is Kiran Budrani. Kiran is an instructional designer and doctoral student. Um, and uh, our research uh, focuses on a systematic review of synchronous online learning. And um, so uh, I used to primarily teach synchronously online. And um, you know, uh, so in an attempt to have my research inform my teaching, I worked on a series of studies in the area of synchronous online learning. And uh, you can see the pattern there from but from 2010, and then in 2017, so we kind of started on this in 2015, and so we worked on a systematic review, the last study. Um, uh, if you want to read, uh, it was published in American Journal of Distance Education in 2017. So that's the study we are going to talk about today. So um, most of you know what synchronous online learning is. So this is when the student and the instructor are brought together in uh, real time, but they are not at the same place. And um, there are some programs, you know, who who operate entirely in a synchronous online manner, uh, whereas several predominantly are asynchronous. And we all know that synchronous components can enhance uh, meaningful interactions and you know the immediacy that um, it involves. Here is a working definition. Um, so it's, students were able to communicate with other students and the instructor through text, audio, and a video-based communication of two-way media. So that's how uh, you know we define synchronous online learning. So uh, research on, I, I'm going to say SOL, okay, <laughs> to keep it short. So there's been a lot of studies on student perception, inst instructor perception, benefits of interaction and engagement. Um, you know, uh, 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 researchers have examined all those areas. 
Um, and I'm going to skip that. So um, in our study, what we did was we looked at studies from 1995 onwards, and we stopped at 2015 because we started analyzing this data in 2015. And um, so there, uh, when we started the study, there were studies in the area of several aspects of online learning, but we did not see a meta-analysis or a systematic review that examined specific to synchronous online learning. So uh, that, that was what motivated us. And we had 11 questions. I'm not going to read the questions, but Kiran is going to walk you through the results uh, you know, based on these questions. And uh, so we followed this four-step systematic review process. You know, We had a protocol that we developed, and then we looked at the identified the literature then we screened and reviewed articles, and then uh, we came up with the findings. So um, I mentioned the dates. The search terms we used were synchronous and online learning, um, and those were the databases we used. And we also did a hand search for the last two years uh, of the study because you know sometimes they don't make it into the database, so we went and uh, looked at the journal specifically. Right. Yeah, so totally we found 157 articles, and uh, three of us coded, uh, and so the inter-rater reliability was at 89%, and those were the se some of the elements that uh, we coded it based on, article information, design, uh, participant demographics, type of synchronous online technology, and we looked at what the IV was, that is specifically if the technology um, was not the independent variable, then we looked at what the dependent variable and data collection methods. So I'm going to hand it over to Kiran. So we found that the top four journals that had synchronous online learning research was Computers and Education, uh, BJET, IRRODL, and the Journal of Assisted Learning. Uh, we also saw some peculiarities. There was no published research articles on synchronous online learning prior to the year 2000. Most articles were published after 2002, uh, and there was a peak in 2012. Um, there were 34 countries represented in the research, ranging from the U.S. to U.K., Taiwan, Canada, Sweden, and others. However, the top three we, uh, were uh, the United States at 26.8% and the U.K. at 11.5%, um, followed by Taiwan. You know, we were thinking about this and we were looking at why this might be so, and we looked at some e-readiness rankings, and these three countries are quite high in their rankings of e-readiness. Uh, we also question why was there a large U.S. representation in the research, and um, we, we, we saw that there might be different terms used in other countries. Uh, we primarily searched for synchronous online learning, um, and other researchers use uh, sim similar terms like virtual learning environments, virtual classrooms, or web conferencing. We also consider that international studies are not seen in peer-reviewed journals, and this is a whole untapped area that may, you know, may have different data and different results. So we looked at the setting where synchronous online learning takes place. We found a variety of settings from higher education to K-12 schools, business, healthcare, military, and military. But you know, predominantly, 68.8% was in higher education. Uh, in terms of the content area, English uh, or foreign language learning and education were primarily the top um, advocates of synchronous online learning. But we don't disregard that other fields are also looking at this, um, engineering, computer science, and IT, science, uh, business, and medical or health fields. Uh, the participants of these courses uh, primarily are young adults between 20 to 30 years old. Um, however, we noticed that out of the 157 articles, only 51 reported the age. So there's some unclear demographics being reported or missing demographics being reported in the research. Um, we also noticed that while student demographics are being researched, there's none being reported on faculty demographics. And um, one thing interesting was there's a no uniform understanding of the labels that are being used between race, ethnicity, and country. For example, um, some state Taiwanese, and this could indicate the uh, ethnicity or the country. In terms of research designs, um, 
majority of synchronous online studies are qualitative. Um, we know that qualitative studies are suited for answering how or why questions and useful to, for constructing new ideas or developing theories when there is little known about this topic. Um, but we also see that you know about 43% are quantitative, which is mostly used to understand the impact of uh, synchronous online learning, its components, or the tools on student learning and behavior. We summarize the tools that were used for synchronous online learning. This include Instant Messengers, Illuminate, Blackboard, Collaborate, WebCity, Adobe Connect, JoinNet, Wimba, and Skype. And the two most common strategies being used for synchronous online um, learning is synchronous chat and, web, and uh, video conferencing. So our study um, provides a big picture of the research that has been done in the past two decades. And now we know a little bit more about learners, uh, the tools being used, the research, in, and how this contributes to the overall field. So um, I'm going to quickly talk about the next step. So um, you know, ideally, we would have liked to follow this up with a with a meta-analysis, uh, but we didn't have enough of studies with the same uh, dependent variable. So uh, we took a different approach. Um, what we did was we used the WhatWorks Clearinghouse um, uh, guidelines, uh, and we examined the quality of some of these quantitative studies. Um, so we examined uh, the quality based on study design, attrition, outcome measures, and confounding factors. So um, there were a total of 86 quantitative studies, um, 47 used experimental designs and 39 used non-experimental designs. And we wanted to see you know, um, uh, where they fall uh, under in terms of quality. Again, I'm not going to give you the results of the study. We are hoping uh, that would be presented in a future AERA or a AECT presentation. Uh, but um, a quick look. So th th those were the different criteria that uh, we used. And um, this is from another study. You know, It's been in interesting. Just just to see where we are at uh, with synchronous learning, um, while there are a number of studies, uh, so this shows that you know uh, participants did respond that you know um, they like synchronous meetings um, uh, to interact um, with the other students and with um, uh, with their peers. So um, you, you're doing this right. The future, what's coming next? So we were looking at what's uh, emerging in synchronous online learning uh, research, and we see that a growing field is in blended synchronous learning environments, or what is coined as BSLE. And you know, to look at this more specifically, it's using a four-tier multi-access learning approach where you combine face-to-face, -face, synchronous, asynchronous, and open learning uh, resources. Um, and you know there are several research being done in this um, um, environment, uh, looking at synchromodal classes, multi-access learning, and multi-sensory learning. Um, interesting tools that are being used look um, uh, particularly focus on virtual presence, such as video conferencing, which is not new, but also now adding virtual reality and telepresence robots to that. Uh, live streaming being used for, for classroom learning, interactive video conferencing being used for classroom learning, and synchronous video classrooms. Um, we also see that there are some distinguished aspects of learner location, looking at point-to-point, -point, multi-point, co-location, and distributed learning uh, settings. So. Um, we also looked at, you know, who's doing some of this work. There's a lot of work being done in Australia, and this is a resource that we found that maybe if you were interested to start looking or even expand what you already have, there's a handbook available for educators um, in blendsync.org. Uh, and blendsync.org advocates for this concept of maybe now we can actually reach the possibility of uniting on campus and distributed learners through rich real-time and synchronous tools. Thanks. So, why not? We have chocolates for questions, and so we'll be giving away chocolates for questions. But first, the panelists will be asking each other some questions before we move to the audience. So, anyone from the panel want to jump up and? We've got microphones in front of each other. You can come up here and ask a question. Who would like to go first? Uh, I'll go, and the question is for Dr. Wiley. Uh, so um, uh, I think this was 
in one of your literature reviews slides, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of it. So you had some data on online courses and then on OER. That's right. So how would you differentiate? I think you had traditional and then online and then OER. So because in online, can we have online courses that has only OER resources or? Right, so, so, so that was comparing online courses that use traditionally copyrighted materials oh. versus OER and face-to-face -face courses that use traditionally copyrighted materials versus OER. So it's okay. always traditionally copyrighted versus OER because okay. some of those courses were fully online and some of them were face-to-face. -face. Okay. And, and we analyzed them separately. Oh, good. Okay, and I couldn't see your numbers clearly. Yeah. So um, did they found that if when traditionally copyrighted material was used, that the drop, withdraw, and final grade was lower, or was it higher? Is that something you In found? aggregate, when, when you take the, so if you, another way of asking that question of aggregating drop and withdraw and final grade is of everyone who was there on the first day, okay. who's still there at the end of class receiving a C or better final grade? Okay. And what that study found across about 35,000 students was that for students who were assigned traditionally copyrighted materials, they came through that funnel at a rate about six points lower than students who came through the OER side. Oh, that's interesting. So just to follow up on that, why might that have happened? Yeah, so uh, why, is, why is OER versus not OER just not another media comparison study, right, is, is, a, is a question that is a reasonable one to ask. And the, the mechanism there is what we refer to as the access hypothesis. So when I assign this end of the table a book that costs 100 200 $300, and this end of the table has something that's either free or maybe cost $10, then some large percentage of you will not buy the textbook, which means you can't read the homework, you can't do the practice homework, whereas everyone on the, or almost everyone on this end of the table will have access to the core materials. So it's the, the basic OER versus not OER question is just one about what difference does access to required instructional materials make. Thank you. As long as I have the mic, <laughs> literally, <laughs> Dr. Bonk, why is there so much more research on MOOCs than OER? That's why I brought my assistants to answer that question. Uh, uh, there's a fascination with, with MOOCs to some degree that because of this, it should be called massive open online content, not course, but people are fascinated with this notion of class. And it was, the hype was built up that it was going to replace higher ed, so there's some of that going on uh, for sure. So that's one reason why. Um, and it's also more predefined. There's a course out there where OER might be used in multiple ways and people can't wrap their heads around what to study. Whereas when you have this, this event, this m massive open online content or course happening that you can look at things like learners coming in, learners leaving more easily because they're recorded. You might not record all the open and content that's out there from OpenStax and the downloads and all that. So it's more readily available data set, I think, and all our 2,500 instructors were easy to find off the Coursera list and the Blackboard list and all that. So, that was a, 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 so gathering the data is easier. I think that's one of the big reasons. And the hype that wrapped around it was a second reason. There are probably many other reasons, too. Um, I think also for a while, MOOC studies were things that people were publishing and trying to get, you know, so young people, young scholars trying to get things on their resume found it, I think, easier to some degree. I've published in open ed resources as well, so I've been in both. Um, but it, it's, it's, those are three reasons, anyhow. Do you have any others you want to add to that? Um. <laughs> ah, we have candy for the question askers. Okay, yeah, there we go. Panelist candy, sure. There's enough, there's enough go around. I think we have a question from the end down there from Faye. Um, Dr. Bank, uh, um, I want to ask about uh, the research you have conducted on MOOC. I know you have, uh, you and uh, Mayna and your doctoral students have reviewed recent research on MOOCs. I wonder whether you have any um, um, like uh, directions that you can see for future trend of in MOOC research. Future research, there's, there's a lot of different paths, but among them is self-directed learning skills are, are vitally needed in the OER space and the MOOC space. So we're looking at self-directed learning. Others are looking at self-regulated learning. Uh, I just, we, on, a, on a study, uh, we submitted 
on fr Friday last week was on self-regulated learning. So those, those are a couple of areas that people are looking at. Uh, mainly, you want to add to the, the uh, future study? Uh, I'm not sure. Based on our literal review, it seems like the research re uh, folks on instructors is uh, much less than the folks on the students. It may be better to do research with two from the MOOC uh, instructor perspective. Yeah. We'll combine the two together. So her dissertation is looking at self-directed learning at, from the instructor point of view, but we're getting access to the students as well. I think studies that do both might be very valuable as, as well. Cross-cultural research, diversity issues, uh, cultural sensitivity, personalization, these are some of the areas we're exploring. There needs to be more in that area, I think. I'm going to uh, somewhat answer a question that you sure. asked during your presentation, no, but, I'm, your <laughs> but then I'm going to throw it back at you as a question. No, I got a question. Oh, okay. I get, are you kidding me? I work this so I get my chocolate. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, I mean, one of the things you asked what, was um, why there weren't more MOOC articles that were appearing in the journal that I edit, Internet and Higher Education. And it's not for lack of submission. We aren't publishing very many of them. And part of the reason why we've not been publishing very many of them is the ones that come through don't have very clear implications for higher education, especially formal institutions of higher education as we have known them. Not that we're you know, shied away from looking at other things, but most of them end up pulling off of data sets of People like me who sign up for a MOOC and kind of poke around in it for a few minutes and maybe finish a little bit and then walk away, which is very different from what people are doing when they are trying to earn a degree in a program. So with that in mind, I would like to hear your thoughts on what implications all of this MOOC research has or perhaps doesn't have for those of us who are interested in furthering and bettering the work that we do in our degree programs within institutions of higher education. And so the, a common perspective in the area of MOOCs is to think about it from a higher ed traditional programmatic standpoint. And when we did some initial work on M MIT OCW, David, uh, a lot of the people were using OCW and OER from the standpoint of enhancing their life, um, helping society, and all sorts of other things that weren't necessarily programmatic in nature. Some were there to get a, a skill or enhancement, a certificate, and so forth, but I think uh, more than 70% of folks were not there for the course, they were not there for a degree, they were not there for the credential. There are many other reasons why people are utilizing MOOC content, and many instructors now are flipping their classrooms using MOOC content, it's being an OER content and other things. So uh, from a programmatic standpoint, some are adding MOOCs as a, the enticement, the first class that one takes to get into a master's program or a certificate program, and then you come on, or for a couple of them, then you come on campus, so that's something programmatically from that people are approaching and doing. Others are taking as I said, MOOC content and embedding into regular, the blended notion of online, bringing MOOC content in to add to the resource base that they have in their classes. Um, as a product of correspondence and television courses from a long time ago that qualified me for grad school, I know there are probably, I'm gonna guess, tens of thousands of people out there that are ramping up to go back to graduate school uh, or are nervous about taking a course or missed the course before going back to medical school or something like that. They are, they are enrolling in, in courses that they don't feel prepared enough for to learn enough content. And so we don't hear about those things. You know, we, in the higher ed space, is so concerned about people passing a course in a degree. You don't hear about people who are reskilling and retooling and feeling good about their personal identity and self-worth and what they can contribute to society as a result of engaging in one of these open educational experiences, oh, you, uh, downloading an open textbook and reading it and sharing it. So I want to change the question to how are the MOOCs benefiting beyond the higher education space? I think that would be an interesting thing to look at. Others, you might have a comment on this, but I have a question for David and I have a question for Ka. Um, I don't know where to start first, but I'm curious, how, how, many of you, how many of you use Facebook? How many of you use WeChat? How many of you use Kakao Talk? How many of you use Line? How many of you use more than one social media platform in a week? 
Okay? How about in a day? So my question for the social media people are, is there research out there that looks at trends by country? Because Ka looked at China, but I'm sure that people are using WeChat well beyond China. Is, and where should that research go that looks at, you know, because every time I go to Thailand, like, you gotta get online, I go to Korea, you gotta get on Kakao Talk, and I am. But what, what, what's the benefit of using multiple, more than one platform? Is anyone looking at the literacy skills or something like that of, of, of the, the, the wealth of social, maybe Vanessa has the answer, maybe one of you guys have the answer to that. I'm earning my chocolate, so. Um, <laughs> I'll take this one first. All right, I don't have a simple answer, but I think, um, like for me personally, um, I know Kurt, you travel a lot. So one thing that social media does, or sometimes even requires is really, you know, whatever works in that area, right? So you, um, wherever you go, instead of trying to introduce the new thing, the easiest to do is just try to adapt what's already there. And maybe then working from there, if there is indeed something else that would work even better, and then you try to take it from there. Um, I really don't see why we would be so fascinated about people using different social media. Um, I don't think there is a need for people to all use one. And I think that would be a great danger. Chocolate. <laughs> what came, came across through um, different systems and different people with whom they're connected. People go where their people are, and it, it all happens quite organically. Um, it doesn't seem to be a big problem. Uh, sometimes it does become an issue. In some of my research, I've talked to people about the, the notion of context collapse. Uh, so, like, for example, Facebook and people who are on Facebook who are... Um, say from South Korea who are going to school in the United States and they are connected to all of their friends in South Korea and now they are connecting to new friends in the United States and they feel like there are different types and levels of sharing that happen publicly on the same platform um, but within these different cultural groups and then they have to start to navigate some of that like do they want to be sharing more freely and personally like they see their American counterparts doing versus their South Korean one and in some instances I've, I've had participants in my research say that they then very intentionally use these different platforms with different groups because it allows them to keep them separate from each other and that's something that they value so there is a lot of value in allowing people to um, have their groups in different places. I can add to Dr. Bong's uh, question. Um, I cannot talk from a research, um, I, there's no exact research, but I'll talk from a perspective of, of an observation that I have from the Philippines. Um, I grew up in the Philippines, and I think one of the important considerations in doing social media research is the device. Uh, while we know that, for example, social media is common, and like the Philippines is a social media capital of Asia, not everybody is using a smartphone to access social media. Twitter, Facebook is being used in very small devices, and the opportunities for that are very different in how it can contribute to learning. Um, another thing that's interesting in, for example, the Philippine context is there is more research coming out on diverse groups um, uh, where they're looking at LGBT communities who are using social media more often to communicate with each other um, now. So, you know, there is different, there are different factors that go beyond just what's the information that we see on the social media, but how did this information get there? And the device contributes a lot to that. I want to ask David a question, but I have a comment. Before, we're going to go to the audience, for, and a couple more questions, we're going to go to the audience, unless you have a comment about this specific thing, Tom? Um, Maine and I, actually, before I talk about that, um, I see that in, Instagram, how many of you Instagram? WhatsApp? WhatsApp seems to be a Middle East kind of thing when I go, go there. Anyhow, I have a question for David. Um, Maine and I went to Ivy Tech in Bloomington. And when we got to Ivy Tech Community College in Bloomington, they kept talking about Open Textbooks Project and uh, Lumen Learning, where David works. 
And when we got back, we were reading all sorts of articles in Inside Higher Ed and other places about the percent of people at Ivy Tech is a big uh, player in this open ed textbook space. So two part, why is Ivy Tech embracing open textbooks? What's, what's unique about them and what's going on? Can you tell us what's going on there? And number two, why are community colleges jumping in before the four year, it seemed to be, uh, before the comprehensive place is up? So I'll answer those in backward order. Um, there's, if you've ever switched a textbook for a course that you've taught for several years and for some reason it became unavailable or you became persuaded to just do something else for a different reason, you know it takes a fair amount of work to change from one textbook to another. And work means time. And at the research intensive institutions, at four year universities, we don't tend to reward faculty for excellence in teaching. We reward them for grant dollars and for the impact factor of their publications and for many things before we reward them for their teaching. And so I think it's harder to persuade uh, four-year institution faculty to take time away from grant writing or to take time away from publication writing to invest time in making this switch of course materials which isn't really going to benefit them directly, it's going to benefit their students primarily, although there are important benefits for faculty as well. In the community college context, faculty are just rewarded for teaching, right? They don't have a grant writing requirement, generally speaking. They don't have a publication or a research obligation. They're teaching a 5-5 five five or a 6-6, six six, and teaching is what they're measured and rewarded on. And so if there's something, if there's a way I can invest my time in just a simple swap to come back to this access hypothesis question from before and have some modest impact on my teaching outcomes, then there's tons of incentives for me to do that as a community college faculty member where they're just, in fact, there are disincentives maybe for me as a university faculty member to spend the time to do that as opposed to writing the next grant. Right? Um, I think Ivy Tech is, well, I know Ivy Tech is doing ton of interesting stuff in adopting OER in place of traditionally copyrighted materials. And I think part of the reason why you hear so much about what's happening at Ivy Tech is the scale at which it's happening there, right? How many community colleges are there in the state of Indiana? It's the, it's the main one. It's Ivy Tech, right? It's, it's essentially a statewide uh, community college. So when they make a decision that the college success course, which every incoming student takes, is going to move from a traditional textbook to OER, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of enrollments. And if you multiply that by a round number of say $100 saved for every student that's impacted by that, you're very quickly saving students millions of dollars. And you start to, you know, you start to hear about that. So uh, th there's a bunch of work that's very thoughtful and very strategic at Ivy Tech about improving success by the adoption of OER. And because Ivy Tech is so big, every decision they make happens at such a scale that you hear more about it than you do similar decisions being made at other smaller community colleges. Oh, I just want to add a comment. As uh, David, Professor David Willey mentioned that there's not too much research on OER. I think because last two weeks I attended the Open Ed um, Conference, I think they are increasing researchers doing research on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to add that. There's more coming. Yeah. Yeah. And, and people should entertain the thought of going to the Open Ed Conference, which will be where next year, David? Next week, you will know. <laughs> We're still signing the contract, so I can't say yet. One or two last panelist questions. Do we have anything left before we go to the audience? I guess we have audience questions now. Several people have answered. Great. I just want a chocolate. <laughs> so what are the principal exports of Peru? No, just kidding. Um, so we've known since the 1960s that time on task is the, one of the most incredible, incredibly important variables in any type of learning situation. Uh, one of my uh, nephews is becoming a master welder. And to become a master welder, they have a very specific number of hours that you spend, hundreds and hundreds and of hours at different levels before he becomes a master welder. But in education, we, we don't really track time on task. Uh, and when we do, the, res the, the results are pretty worrying. For example, the National Study of Student Engagement, the NESI studies have been done for decades, show that the time that students spend studying 
is steadily declining, okay? Meanwhile, great inflation is shooting up, which is very weird. Uh, talk about weird ideas. And I remember years ago, Betty Collis did a study where she converted a face-to-face -face course to an online course and found that the time that students spent studying dropped amazingly when it went online. And I hear in elevators, students talking to each other saying, oh, you're in that class? You should have taken that online. You don't have to do anything. It's so easy. So let me throw out a provocative hypothesis. Online learning dumbs down learning. Do we have the research to defend that? Do we know? I don't think we do. So what do you think about that? I'll, I'll tap into that a little bit um, on, on two fronts. One, I'm not sure that this is strictly an online learning problem. I think the difference is that we tend to, uh, and what you're describing there for online courses is really just poor course design, if that's how students can get through and get a good grade. I would argue, though, that there's just as much poor course design happening in campus-based courses. You will see more time for student engagement because we put attendance requirements on them. Sometimes we penalize them if they do not attend. We hold them as a captive audience. But do we use all of those moments in the classroom in a meaningful way to really support learning? I, I, I'm skeptical that, that that's what's happening. But I think that in online learning, one of the things that has happened is a little bit of the tail wagging the dog. And this actually comes from, I'll be presenting on this tomorrow afternoon. Um, I surveyed a number of online instructors and some of what comes out of that when you ask them about like what are you doing with for example discussion which is a great way if you do it well if you do it thoughtfully and if you really you know you've got to design it and you have to facilitate it and you have to assess it as well um, a lot of them weren't doing that in their classes and their reasons for not doing it was because the first time they tried it people didn't really participate, and the students resisted, so they decided to not do it anymore. They let the students guide what was going to happen there, rather than saying, as an instructor, clearly, I need to change something about how I have designed this discussion activity. I need to change the requirements for student participation. I need to make it something that is going to be more worthwhile for the students to participate in. There are so many things that we can do. And when you look at the really well-designed online courses that use discussion, and they don't all have to do that, but when you look at those, you will find that they are using discussion in a way that is meaningful, that further students' learning, that, that engages students in acts of articulation and reflection related to the content of the class. But students will resist. And if you allow them to resist, then we get to the dumbing down of the courses. There you go. Yeah, I, I think Florence and uh, Kieran probably want to address this because it fits right in what they have to say. Yeah, I'll not, not more too. synchronous, but I just want to um, add to what uh, Vanessa said. And I d definitely agree. I think it's the importance of quality. And um, you know, um, our campus is big on quality matters, and all our mo several of our courses are quality matter certified. And so, uh, and we are presenting on the study tomorrow too. So we asked the students, you know, what are some components in online courses that enhance your learning or in engagement? And two things that came up was uh, one was instructional activities. You know, what type of activities uh, are being done in the online class? And then the second was instructional material that's being used. So I think, you know, if you're thoughtful and um, it's just not test-based and, you know, hands-on time, and being in instructional technology programs, I think most of our courses are built like that. I think um, online learning can actually increase learning compared to even, you know, the traditional methods. So there's that hypothesis too. So if it's well designed. I think I come across um, a group of researchers who done uh, research on deliberate practicing. And what they found is there the time spent on the task 
And sometimes it's not effective, so they are not a good predictor of their learning outcome. Instead, it's the amount of time they spend on deliberate practicing that really significantly predict their uh, learning outcome. So when they talk about deliberate practicing, they uh, talk about the situation where the instructor set up the challenge, which is beyond the learner's comfortable zone, and the learner are constantly provide uh, with feedback uh, on how he could improve. I think one of the challenging for online, this is, might be particularly challenging uh, for online learning as compared to face-to-face -to -face, uh, face -face learning where a good instructor will instantly see student, how students react to the material and provide challenge based on student reaction. Um, but I definitely see there, um, we, we have been putting more and more emphasis on how to make online learning more um, interactive, how to provide um, timely and frequent feedback to the students so that they can progress um, based on, um, by um, uh, meeting up the challenges that provided in the course. I think that might um, help us greatly enhance the quality of online learning. Carl? Yeah. I just want to add a little bit more, um, kind of a follow up. Um, I, I, I agree with everyone you know, has said. And I also want you to add one thing, though. Um, why do we care so much about time on task? And with the very different learners that we have now in traditional K-12 classrooms or in online higher ed, or when you work on your know, lifetime learning. Um, we're dealing with people, not dealing, we're working with people who are very fast pacing and who do not necessarily always reserve a big chunk of time for one particular task, but rather they would probably be multitasking or if we are smart enough to work with them with the fragmental pieces of time, that might be a better strategy you know, to work with them rather than you know, um, trying to stick with the old rules that we've, we've been using, trying for so many years. Um, and also as related to online learning in particular, I don't think the time on task is that important, but rather I've done some studies looking at online learning behavioral patterns um, that might help, help you to predict, you know, some patterns are more likely to lead to a success in a certain type of online learning environment. For example, if it's problem-based learning environment or if it's, you know, another kind of environment. So uh, I would think, you know, um, those thoughts and practices might be more helpful uh, when we think about those um, old and new challenges right now. Just my two cents. So, Kira? And um, I agree with everyone too, but just to you know, add this component of the changing role of who helps faculty design courses, where you have the rise of like the rise of instructional design professionals now who are actually working with faculty to not necessarily look at only time on task, but choice of task. And when you have a choice of task that, that echoes you know, what our, the colleagues here have said, where it's what's the course design, you know, looking at is it just um, you know, a sequence of activities and testing, or are we looking at deeper, richer experiences which promote more engagement, project-based, inquiry-based, case-based learning, which now changes the choice of task ultimately changing the time of task and the depth of understanding, ultimately learning outcome. So, you know, there are more factors to look at and how faculty can be supported in these aspects. So we've heard from everyone pretty much on the panel time. You've asked a great question. David, did you want to jump in on this one too? <laughs> Do I get another chocolate? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess, Tom, I'd say two things. One, well, I'll say three things. I won't argue with your great inflation comment that's objectively happening. Um, two, in, in every other aspect of our life, we expect to see productivity gains from education. I'm sorry, from technology. Right? Every year, the same amount of money should buy me more, that does more, that does it faster, that's more powerful. Um, whether I'm building cars or buying a computer or whatever it is I'm doing, we expect technology to accelerate kind of productivity or the, the amount of work we get done per unit time everywhere else. Um, it's interesting when we push back against that idea in education. Um, and three, I, I think the idea, and I don't think that you're arguing this necessarily, but I think the, the broader idea that 
When things happen faster online, it means that online's poor quality relative to face-to-face -face somehow suggests that face-to-face -face is time optimized. And I think you could walk into any classroom in the country and see that that's not the case. You know, Tom, your friends in Australia had an article with you 20 years ago about shovelware, right? Chan Harrington and Ron Oliver and you had talked about shovelware, shoveling the face to face up online. I worry a bit about open ed and online open contents being download only and just being a squirrel, squirreling it away on your flash memory stick for a rainy day and maybe never coming back to it. That's a worry, but that's also an opportunity. We can look at it from two different lenses that people can take that content even once the course is done and open it up later when they're in another class or another experience. So we have to stop, I think, thinking about courses being 15-week experiences to being something that can be uh, something that can impact you wherever you are, whatever moment in, in your life. I think Kieran and it, I'll answer this question first and we'll go to that one. Um, Tom, I think that global education from the synchronous stuff that Kieran mentioned and Florence mentioned, I think that using Zoom to bring in guests from around the world is different for online, enables you to do that, that we didn't have as readily in the face-to-face -face environments. And in Tech Trends next month, I have an article discussing how do you do that. So if you get Tech Trends, I have an article on feedback, an article on global, kind of global ed, um, and I talk about using the ACT Legends and Legacy videos, as well as bringing in live guests and combining those two things together. But I also think we have to have recursive assignments Pedagogy has to be more important than the technology. So come back to the assignments over and over. Do something with it. Expand it, not just receive it. Um, not, and not just create new content, but come back to that and reflect on it as a team, as an individual. This virtual napkin space enables us to do some things that are social, culturally powerful in nature that we didn't do previously. And I think that's a dif dif uh, differentiator between online and face-to-face, -face. that's a game changer, actually. And I do think that uh, there's more and more opportunities online. You can, you got my books about this. Um, we've talked a lot, and we got a lot more questions here. So, Clark. Yeah, thanks. The things I'll do for chocolate. Um, I admit that I, I was able to misinterpret the description of the session because I was looking for sort of the summaries, the outputs, what the research tells us, not so much what we found out about who's doing what research. I understand it makes sense for this audience. I appreciate, David, you and specifically mentioning that there's evidence that using OER doesn't do any damage, right? That's, that's a good outcome. But I was wondering, as an outcome of what you said, and, and Vanessa and, and Florence, you both were mentioning, it depends on the quality of the pedagogy. So I'm wondering if you could just give us e, you know, one to three things to do with social media, with synchronous, with, um, you know, or, uh, or MOOCs, or three things to avoid just to give, you know, people like me who are really focused on actually trying to make better pedagogy some guidelines that might have emerged from the research you were looking at. All right, with social media, I'm gonna come back again to this notion of context collapse, as well as concerns with privacy, and say that as instructors and instructional designers who are looking for ways to incorporate social media use and learning experiences, we need to be sensitive to how learners feel about using some of these platforms and or merging their social media worlds which can incorporate people coming from different walks of life. And I have heard people say things in the past like, you know, oh, on Blackboard, on Canvas, the discussion forum sucks, so let's just move all the students off to a Facebook group because they're on there anyway. Well, they're not all on there. And I've had alarming discussions with people when I said, you know, I've surveyed this population time and again, and every time it comes up, that there's about 10% who are not on Facebook and they have a reason. Like, well, I don't care, then I guess they'll miss out. Is that really the attitude that we want to take? Do we like the idea that we could be making our students uncomfortable by pushing them on some of these platforms? So while there are some really great things that social media allows us to do in terms of moving to a learner-centered classroom. That would be, an, the second point I would make is make sure you're actually using it in a learner-centered way, not just as a broadcast platform for yourself as an instructor, but if you're really going to want to use it in a learner-centered way, consider moving off of some of the major social networks 
or finding ways to help your students interact in a class without leaving behind a digital footprint related to the class that makes them uncomfortable um, having it connected in whichever direction with the rest of their life. And um, I can add to on the synchronous, uh, synchronous online learning. So some of uh, the reasons of best practices, you know, from, both from research and from practical experience, I would say, um, I've learned is, um, you know, if, if you're a primarily asynchronously online program, mandating synchronous online uh, sessions do not work. So you might want to make it optional and archive it, uh, because there is a reason why the students are opting to be in an asynchronous program. Um, so recording is very important, even if you invite guest speakers, uh, they may or may not show up. Um, so some of the way reasons why I do it, um, and I do at least two synchronous sessions in any given semester, is um, I do like a mid -sem like a, a Q and A session. You know, like if you have major projects coming up, you know, those are great time to be there and answer questions uh, that you don't want to do asynchronously. Um, that's really helped. I do office hours synchronously, you know, uh, they may choose to attend or not, so that's um, the other thing. Team presentation, so at the end, you know, if you want each other to see each other's work, I think synchronous uh, tools have been great. Um, so those are some, some reasons I do it. I, I've gone light on, you know, um, uh, how much I use, especially after having thought synchronously every week, you know, now um, I've definitely cut out. Do you want to add, Kiran, anything? Um, I think one of the opportunities that are some opportunities that synchronous online learning now affords, particularly in that sort of blended synchronous aspect, is now bigger opportunities to do group work, where before synchronous or asynchronous was more of an individual solo learning experience, and maybe it was just commenting and you know peer feedback every now and then. Now you can actually do case studies and group work collaboratively in multimodal. Um, uh, uh, modalities, but uh, also this whole concept of distributed groups doing different things, maybe in different countries, maybe in different states, maybe even different cities. It doesn't have to be necessarily far, it's just in different places because everybody has different levels of access and convenience. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Let's go to another question. So, kind of follow up to that, and I was trying, you know, thinking about asking the uh, social media researchers about the implication, but kind of Dr. Dan kind of answered the question from the practical implications perspective, but I want to ask the research implications of the social media research. So where is this going? And uh, given the, uh, you know, kind of compared to the question about the implications for MOOC, uh, the social media, we have more tools available and more loosely structured. So where do we, where are we going in terms of the research? What do we want to accomplish? And is it really, is it against the nature of the social media, what we're doing or what we're looking at? Or can we, uh, so what can we learn from the social media research in educational realm? Thank you. No? All right. Um, I, I think that we're seeing a lot of fragmented research right now and a lot of platform-based research. So, you know, let's just look at Twitter. Let's just look at Facebook. Um, what we're not seeing extrapolated from that quite as much that I personally would like to see more of them that I think would be very meaningful to us as educators would be to extract from all of that and look at the, the types of interactive, collaborative, knowledge sharing activities that can be occurring through these platforms and then determine whether or not it's making a difference. You know, so we're, we're flipping things. We're making them more learner-centered. We're getting learners to contribute to the classroom. We're expanding the walls of the classroom so our learners have a wider audience but also have a wider base of learning materials that they can be drawing from and sharing in the class. So what? Does that make a difference? And does it make a difference in any number of ways? Does it make a difference for their motivation to participate in class? Does it make a difference um, learner engagement and potentially leading to performance? Does it make a difference in things? And this is where we haven't gone yet longitudinally. So if we do this in a class, you know, what does it do for the class? I don't know, but have I now just set somebody up to be a more effective lifelong learner? Have I set them up to do self-directed professional development activities long-term 
when they get past my classroom. I know as an educator, that's something I'm concerned about, but instead we just see all these one-shot studies of, you know, I use Twitter in my class and here's what happened. Well, you know, where are we leaving these students further down the road? I think that's something that we need to start thinking about in the research, as well as how do we now, uh, you know, we've had the tools, we've had the networks, we've played with them for a while. Now let's start really talking to each other about what we want to do with it. I totally agree, and I just want to add a little bit and follow up. I think that social media really opened up the opportunity to provide learner, uh, give learner the opportunity to find out his own learning path. Some, uh, based on my own research, sometimes it just it doesn't work for everybody, and a lot of people don't like you using social media in the classroom. But there are always people who are excited to. Uh, get to know this tool and use it in a very creative way that can benefit their own learning. Just like the um, quote I had in my presentation, uh, that teacher, uh, without social media, Twitter, she will not be able to uh, know all the resources posted by other educators in the blog, and she will not be get involved in a conference that where he can, she can meet a group of um, similar teachers who have the same concerns. So I think we, um, one of the purpose of education is provide um, a variety of opportunities so that learner can find out a path for their own. And I think social media is this kind of tool, one of the kind of many tools <laughs> to provide these opportunities. We've got five minutes left, maybe time for two more questions, maybe three if you answer quickly, so let's grab a couple more here. Yeah, Lucy? Yeah, so my question is related to the new ADA compliance legislation that came out uh, January 2018. It's a hot topic at my institution, so my question would be, how do you think it affects all these trends and opportunities in learning such as MOOC, Oh, you are social media in our online classes and synchronous opportunities. So one or two or three so people grab that. Positively or negatively, how does Who would that like to grab this one? That a challenge or an opportunity for us? Sorry, I did this three times. I can start. Um, I, I can speak as an instructional design practitioner. We are highly involved in um, this, um, you know, uh, compliance issue, especially that we are moving a lot of our online courses to Quality Matters, and Quality Matters is new rubric, sixth uh, edition rubric, integrates a higher level of ADA compliance, particularly to text and images. So I think the answer to your question doesn't necessarily pertain to a particular tool or, you know, content format. Um, but it really looks at, we need to give some emphasis on, we have forgotten this, uh, you know, forgotten to recognize that content and experiences should be inclusive, um, and not for any specific type of learner, but for all learners. And it doesn't matter that anybody, any one of us can benefit from an additional caption here, an additional format or modality of information. So I think, there's a lot more emphasis that should be placed or conscious effort to be placed on course design, material design, you know, interaction design, where a lot of these um, will impact all kinds of learners and how information is received and reciprocated. Let's go to another question. We have two minutes left. Thank you so very much. Um, you talked about MOOCs and um, Prof. there talked about OER. See, I am involved with the African Virtual University. I don't see much difference. It's not A or B. We integrate OER in MOOCs. And the other point is, a lot of people will give bad mouth into MOOCs. We have to know why MOOCs. What are you using it for? You have a lot of courses like Coursera. They have good courses, they have bad courses. I remember 
the very first course I took on Coursera was on de designing e-learning courses. So many people applied for that course, and it went berserk. And they had to just stop the course, said it wasn't working well. So sir, when we talk of mocks, which works are we talking about? Is it for academics, or is it open to the public? Who are the designers of those courses? You see, I remember using Mega's book when I was an undergraduate, sorry, when I was doing my um, postgraduate program at Wayne State University. We used Mega's, that's in the early, late 70s, early 80s. When I look at most of the e-learning courses today, they are not different from what Mega wrote in his book. It's just taking, translating the textbook into online course. Most of the courses you see on MOOCs are just that. Yeah, yeah. Take, taking yeah. the classroom lecture and converting it into an e-learning course without using good instructional design models. Mm -hmm. Then I want to talk about the publications you looked at. I look at publications in this part of the world, the research that you did, they are sort of biased. In Africa, you have a lot of work done. It's just that you don't have access to those journals. And if we send articles to this part of the world, many a times they are not published. Okay, we'll try and answer that now because we have one, one minute left. Um, we have a book called MOOCs and Open Education in the Developing World with a chapter from the African Virtual University. We're now working on volume two on MOOCs and Open Education in the Developing World or Emerging Economies with chapters from Kenya, South Africa, Egypt, and other places. I'd be happy to talk to you about that. My team is looking at instructional design and we'll be presenting the data on Malaysia and Indonesian MOOCs tomorrow and the next day. And this will be talking about that. Um, so we are focused on exactly what you're trying to say, how you can pedagogically enhance and not just replicate face to face. I mean, it's not exactly what you're asking, but to some degree. I have a feeling David's got something to respond to on this one. Um, Let's talk after, because we're. Okay. So what I'm going to do here, just to wrap up real quickly, is um, I did bring some copies of the study number one. And I'm going to leave those here free to anyone who would like that. Um, Maina and Nissa has three copies. I want them to meet people. So they've got copies of this. If you don't get one from here, I've got one of phase one and phase two. If anyone else has articles, we can put them here and make them available. Uh, I do want to thank the panel in a couple different ways. Uh, they are all generous of their time here. This is the longest session of AACT on hour 45. I want to be thankful for your time, hour and 45 minutes. We've covered a lot of territory here today. Wow, I mean, look at the gamut of, of um, technologies and pedagogies that we've, we've addressed. Um, so this has been a wonderful experience, but let's thank the panelists for giving their time and energy and all that today. <laughs> Please come up and meet the panelists. Um, I want the panelists to get a picture, so don't leave before you go. But let's get a chance to meet some people. So come up and meet some people and uh, grab a free copy of our, our uh, research that just got published. So. <laughs>